It is Monday, October 15th, 2018. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And uh, it was a very interesting get your ass kicked at Jiu-Jitsu Monday, and certainly not the typical fare. Um, we did a lot of uh, back stuff today, uh, mostly uh, back escapes. Um, very, very important material, I'll tell you that. Um, I, and I'll need like at least eight hours more of of just drilling alone before I'll start feeling any bit comfortable with what we are doing today. Um, but uh, yeah, we did uh, we did some interesting stuff. I I really like escaping from the back. I don't mind escaping from the back only because it does require a lot of energy to try and retain your opponent. And so while you're burning yourself out retaining me, I'm trying to escape. And it, and usually it seems to be a uh, a matter of attrition for me. I I, I tuck my uh, I tuck my chin really well, and um, I'm usually good about keeping hands on the attacking arms. Um, I didn't do any of my better escapes today, and uh, I, I don't know. I, I it might be because it was the first day, the, the first class that I've had in a while, or since Friday. I don't know. All I do know is I'm feeling like I need to add at least one more day, one more class to my uh, jujitsu weeks. I feel like I'm stalling out just a teeny tiny and kind of kind of circling the same pool over and over and over again, you know, not really feeling like I'm escalating in my competency level or, or my comfort level. And so, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm thinking I, I might need to start adding an additional class every week to try and uh i don't know beef it up you know take it take it to that next level or something i don't know but uh we did do a uh, interesting shark tank today and uh, basically the game was that you have one person down and one person behind them with them with their seatbelt position or you know seatbelt grip over the shoulder and also the hooks in and trying to escape from that and, you know, whoever managed to escape would be the, the one to hold the next guy and so on and so forth. Well, I came to a couple positions where uh, it was very difficult for me to escape. Um, but I did manage to get to where I was in a more turtled position. And so both times that I did that, I'm like, well, you know, I already got my head down and my feet are touching the ground. So maybe if I just push off from here, then, it you know, I could flip me and my opponent over and, and escape that way and that that's actually how I did most of my escapes <laughs> was uh, I, I wasn't effective enough at uh, shaking them off my back per se or rotating into them which is one of my one of my more favorite ways to escape the back take because it goes immediately from like the worst position you could possibly be in in jujitsu to one of the better positions, you know, where you're in, where you're uh, in half guard and a semi semi side control kind of kind of business, um, it's very dominant versus um, having somebody on your back and having a pair of hooks in you. <laughs> so yeah, you know, like I said, I didn't get my my favorite escapes, but I did manage to escape using some some really unorthodox technique. Um, but it, it was effective, and that's in the in the the end of it all. That's that's what it counts. Did you get out of it, and, and were you able to, you know, regain your composure and and then go on to the attack? And um, as far as that went today, I, I managed to do that. The coach did talk to us a little bit towards the at the end, and I I don't know if it was because of something that I did or something that someone else was doing. Um, <coughs> Because I, I tend to get face grabbed a lot. You know, I, I, I tend to get cross faced a lot when somebody's on my back and they're trying to resume control. They, uh, they tend to uh, get me across the face a lot, and it's because I like to tuck my chin. You know, it's a danger, and, you know, it only buys you a moment or two, but it, it, it's definitely effective in helping you to keep from being choked. And like I said, it's, all, it's only momentary. I mean, you cannot sustain, like if somebody's got a really, really big arm and they got it wrapped around your chin, they're going to break your fucking jaw if they, if they clamp down on it. So, like I said, 
it's effective but only in the in the case where you're using it to try to try and keep your head in a position to where they're not actually choking you but you got to you don't have very long in that position before you do have to change it out for something that does not hurt as much <laughs> it's just it's not a comfortable position to be in and uh, it doesn't get any better the longer you're in it so yeah you know tuck your chin but be be prepared to be rolling one, one side or the other you know rolling into the elbow or out of out, out of way towards the uh, towards the wrist, one way or the other. But you cannot stay there, as as Connor found out. And uh, I I didn't comment too much on that fight because honestly I felt like everybody in in the planet had already commented on it and pretty much said everything that had to really be said. So I, you know I I didn't want to really beat that dead horse, <laughs> you know. But uh. Yeah, that was um, that was one of the points where where Connor Connor really got it. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder about that guy's um, longevity as far as his uh, his endurance on the mat. And I mean, I know he's got good conditioning and and his footwork is is really really great. It's one of the things I really like watching about him is that he he does use his his uh, footwork to trip out his his opponents and stuff. And I I like that a lot. Um, the one thing I don't like about him is his mouth, and so it, it it was um it was a bit satisfying watching Khabib choke him out, or or at least uh, neck crank him, <laughs> which I I'm actually called that. Um, I, I told people at my gym that uh, that Khabib was going to get him, but I was I was mistaken in the round. Um, I, I thought he would get him about halfway through the second round, but oh well. Well, I'll, I'll take the I'll take the rear naked choke in the in the fourth round just as easy as I will in the second round. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. Last time I thought about it um, since then, but last time I didn't even have a first dance, man. We just went right to it. So let's go ahead and throw down to a little bit of body count here. And I saw this one on my Twitter feed today, and I love this song so much that it's just got to be the ski mask way. First dance by Body Count here on Koi Metal. And that was disturbed with stupefy. <clears throat> yeah, we were. Um, it was over in the Telegram here, and we were talking about the uh, the inf- or no, I'm sorry, it was in the Discord. Yeah, I'm all over the fucking place. I can hardly even tell where I am half the time. Anyway, uh, yeah, we were talking about the uh, the Eastern Bloc Russian states contaminating the mind of the Western individual via dubstep you know it's happening anyway um <laughs> just a mild diversion there uh yeah back to uh, exactly what we're going to talk about today you know i hadn't i hadn't planned it cuz i never do um but i do have several tabs open in my browser here and uh i think we can uh, i think we can draw some some decent fare for the evening um <clears throat> and you know we're, we're just going to touch down on this one first because uh it's been covered a lot you know uh, mr rubini um going off in front of congress and you know it, it was a um it was an interesting presentation but by uh, both individuals that did talk although i did feel like some of some of the information was at least mildly rep- misrepresented on both sides. Um, I would say Mr. Rubini, um, he, he probably got all of his students together that are involved in crypto Twitter and, and talked to them about it. And so, you know, of course, we got Maximalists and all that other stuff in, in their classroom or in his classroom. And so he probably got a really skewed perspective on it. And that and I, I do think the man is a bit more um, a bit more savvy to stuff than than yeah, than people give him credit for. It, it, it's kind of funny to me. I, when I, when I was watching his presentation, I was seeing enough smirk that it was it was like, dude, this guy's been fucking. He, he he's been flipping satoshis for at least a year, and he's putting it on for these guys. You know, just to give a uh, a counter perspective. I, I don't know if that's actually true or not, 
but I I got the uh, I got the same feeling when I was reading articles about uh, Jamie Dimon whining about uh, Bitcoin when um, when it was still on its spike. And of course, his predictions eventually borne out true. Um, but in the, in the meantime, though, he was saying that like before the big ass spike and everybody made a shit ton of money. So, I, like I said, I, I felt like uh, he was fudding a long position at that time. And I, I probably did mention that. And so, you know, Rubini is no different. I think he's just fudding a fucking long position. Anyway, uh, I got this article here on InsideBitcoins.com. It was by Trevor Smith. So, yes penis. It was October 15th, 2018. Uncategorized. Whatever the fuck that means. U.S. Congress continues to investigate cryptocurrency regulation. I, I, I'm just going to say it. U.S. Congress, if any of your members or, or advisors or whatever are listening to this show, just don't. Just like, I don't know, observe. Take a good look at maybe maybe dabble a little. You know, if you guys want to really learn about this shit, unlike a lot of industries, you could literally sit there in that Congress room and a competent crypto investor would be able to walk you through at least your first trade during a, a one or two hour uh, presentation. And you, you would be able to do it from your phone or your device or your whatever. Man, I mean, just like, do one of those. You, you really want to learn about this shit? You really want to understand what's going on? That's how you do it. And, and like I said, unlike a lot of industries, this isn't, you know, jumping out of fucking airplanes. This isn't this isn't handling a jackhammer or, or driving a semi or some shit like that. There's no barrier to entry to this. Do you have a bank account? then you can set up an exchange account. And, and, and like I said, somebody could probably get you trading. You know, it's like br- bring a $100 bill with you. They'll do a OTC trade straight to you. They'll send you $100 worth of cryptocurrency at the beginning of the thing and, and do that for each of the members. You know, you give them the 100 bucks. He gives you 100 bucks worth of Bitcoin cash, whatever it is right then and there or Bitcoin or whatever. And so you get the process down of the ex- the exchange of monetary value via cryptocurrencies. And again, that's just one medium for doing it, but it would give you the experience that we all do we all get. You know that that anxiety waiting for your first confirmation and shit like that, you know? And then when you get on an exchange, getting on a, you know, a decent exchange or whatever, and, and doing your first trades, and then, and then if, you, if you don't wreck, um, cashing it back out and putting it into a wallet, maybe even taking it to a vendor and spending it as money, you know, buying a good or service with it. This is, this is how you will learn how cryptocurrencies work. But you must keep in mind that much of what is being achieved as far as the transition to monetary value and whatnot does not include banks. Does not include U.S. dollars. And, and again, depending on exactly what actions you're, you're taking. You know, If you're just trading from Bitcoin to altcoins or something like that, you're not going to be interfacing with the US dollar and that's cool. Anyway, continuing on. This uh, this movement isn't going to stop anytime soon and um, I don't expect anything that you you have to say or come up with in your investigations or whatever is going to really stop any of it. And so as far as I'm concerned, the best approach is to just don't worry about it. You know, it, it, there's nothing in any of the any of what we're doing that changes theft or fraud. Theft is theft, fraud is fraud. But these are something to be determined after the fact. You know, it, after the crime has been committed, 
then we can we can review the materials and there's probably never been a more accurate means of discerning exactly what happened and when then then it, it there's never been a tool as good as the bitcoin blockchain or other cryptocurrencies blockchains that are based on proof of work of course there's never been a better way to track this shit. And so, <laughs> determining when the fraud happened, determining who committed the fraud, it's a lot easier than U.S. dollars. Even though, um, I would suppose once you get that, get them into the digital realm, they're, they're easy enough to track, but that's all based on a layer of trust that we place in brokers such as Visa, or Bank of America, or Wells Fargo, and with Bitcoin, the the network itself is global. And, and while some ex- the exchanges themselves aren't global, um, some of them are restricted to what jurisdictions that they are operating within, while others are not. Um, the the monetary value it doesn't need them to be changed change from one person to another you know I mean we can do that without an exchange anyway continuing on US Congress continues to investigate cryptocurrency regulation as crypto and blockchain development accelerates US lawmakers are taking an increasing interest in understanding the technology recently the Congress has begun to explore the topic in earnest and their and the first crypto-related legislation has also been introduced. Although it is unlikely that major regulatory action will be taken this year, there is no doubt that congressional action on cryptocurrency is on the horizon, and it won't change a fucking thing. This past week, the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs held an open hearing entitled, quote, Exploring the Cryptocurrency and Blockchain Ecosystem, at which it heard testimony from prominent cryptocurrency critic Nuriel Rubini, as well as crypto advocate and director of research at Coin Center, Peter Valkenberg. The two men made counter-arguments on a variety of issues in the blockchain space, and members of the committee were clearly interested in obtaining a better understanding of the technology. This hearing follows actions by the House of Representatives, which in July held a public hearing entitled, quote, The Future of Money, Digital Currencies, where it also heard from a, <coughs> from a number of experts and, the prominent, and prominent figures in the crypto space. Like the recent Senate hearings, House members present showed significant interest, yet many also clearly had much to learn about the technology. This was the second hearing that the House had held on the subject, and last month, 12 House members sent the Securities and Exchange Commission an open letter asking the agency to clarify its position on crypto and how it plans to regulate it. It doesn't. And it's not their job to regulate it, so just don't worry about it. To a large extent, Congress act, congressional actions on crypto reflects the diverse attitudes and positions held by professionals and the general public. Many members support it, others oppose it, and most have have I'm sorry, and most have much to, much to learn. For example, Tom Emmer, a Republican Minnesota, is openly pro-cryptocurrency and in September introduced three pro-crypto bills. Conversely, Senator Elizabeth Warren, DMA, a Democrat in Massachusetts, I suppose, has been vocal in her warnings about potential fraud related to ICOs. Others, such as Senator Sherrod Brown, a Democrat Ohio, have voiced similar concerns. Not surprisingly, some members of Congress have become cryptocurrency investors. In June, the the House Ethics Committee issued a memorandum requiring all members to disclose digital currency holdings valued at more than $1,000. Bob Goodlatte, Republican Virginia, 
has become the first to do so, revealing that he holds between $17,000 and $80,000 in Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Ethereum. Of great significance is the upcoming midterm elections, which, as always, will result in many new members joining the ranks of the House and the Senate. No doubt a number of these fresh faces will be educated on blockchain and cryptocurrency. Their presence in the congressional term, which will begin early 2019, is all but certain to bring a greater focus on blockchain development and regulation. The movement of blockchain into mainstream use will create a number of challenges for lawmakers, as they will be forced to address the substantial changes that the technology will certainly bring. The next few years promise to be rev revolutionary across the entire space. Thus now, th thus now is thus the time? Dude, <clears throat> come on. Thus now is the time for members to begin educating themselves and developing outlines for how the government can address its growth and adoption. Um, yeah, you can't. Um, there is something very important about cryptocurrencies that you must keep in mind, and that is that it is our choice to involve ourselves in them. And so nothing that the Congress says or tries to do will stop us from whether or not we are going to invest in them and how we are going to invest in them. You can't do it. You can say a bunch of stuff, but you're basically lying to your constituents because you can't really do the things that you're saying that you will do. Meaning trying to uh, enforce on them and shit like that. If people want to be hidden with cryptocurrencies, if they want to be anonymous with cryptocurrencies, they will do it. And, and that's one of the realities that, that people in South Korea, in China, in India, in Iran, in Russia, in Bolivia, in Venezuela, and all these other places are finding out. I mean, look, if, if Congress really wants to educate themselves on the total span of effects that would be experienced with varying regulatory regimes, you know, reg as far as like intensity, you know, what what we go to as far as enforcement goes. If you want an education on the entire span of the evolution of it, look at Venezuela. Right now, they are trying to legitimize, or at least their government is trying to legitimize the quote unquote crypto boulevard. This should tell you where you're going to be in a decade with this regulatory bullshit. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it'll be a little bit faster here in the United States. Maybe it'll happen just as fast as it happened in Venezuela. But there's an evolution. And it's been repeated fucking everywhere. It starts with the, the rapid debasement of their, their normal fiat currency, their nationally, their nationally regulated fiat currency. It just goes into hyperinflation, right? So they start shifting over to cryptocurrencies just so they can fucking live, just so they can afford to eat, pay rent, pay for electricity, pay for clothing. And they're going so far as to buy stuff in other other neighboring countries and then having it shipped to them from there and amazingly enough I guess FedEx still works down there you know, FedEx and UPS and all that I, I don't know if UPS would be down there maybe they are probably global anyway the point being is there is an observable evolution to this and it will not be any different anywhere I mean well, <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that <clears throat> there are things that will make it slightly different depending on where it occurs. But So I, I've already outlined the, the, the first segment. Okay, People start developing a need for cryptocurrencies. 
because cryptocurrencies serve the use case of putting food in their mouth better than their national fiat currency does. That's one. Two, they start mining it. You know, at first they're just trading it. Then they start mining it. Then the cops try and bust them for mining. You know, they start confiscating the mining gear. Only the cops don't like destroy the, the gear or anything like that, and they don't turn it into any federal authority. They start mining with it. They take the shit home and they mine with it because they have to fucking eat too, and they can't make enough money working for the government to do that. They are just as fucked as everybody else around them. So they do the same thing that everybody else does to, to facilitate that accumulation of some monetary value that they can use to put food in their mouth. The next, <laughs> the next thing is that because of the increased, uh, the increased scrutiny that they're experiencing, they can no longer uh, have large-scale Bitcoin mining. They switch to altcoins and they start mining them with smaller gear. Stuff that doesn't suck up as much electricity, but still gives them enough money that they can keep putting food in their mouth. And and then, <laughs> the, the next thing you do is say, well, okay, we, we can't stop them from, from mining. We can't stop them from transacting from other, in other currencies. So, we'll create a currency that we'll use... Uh, and, and we'll make it a cryptocurrency and we'll try and force them to use that instead. <clears throat> and it will fail because you are the persons creating the situation that has driven them to using cryptocurrencies to begin with. And so because of that, whatever coin that you're issuing and circulating into the, into the ecosystem, it'll be mostly used for speculation and whatever services or whatever that you require your people to pay for with with this currency, and I, I guess they're doing something like um, you have to you have to pay for your state li- your state uh, state ID with with the Bolivar or some shit like that. <laughs> I'm I'm not going to be keep hodling Bolivars if I'm a Venezuelan because I expect the government that has completely debased its fiat currency to be just as suspect of wanting to debase the volume of the boulevard. They've already committed that fraud on me once. Why would I trust that they wouldn't do it again? Just because it's on a fucking blockchain does not mean it's true. Bullshit in, bullshit out. And if I know that the person that, that you know, it is is administering it as a fucking liar. If I know they are a liar, if they have a history of fucking lying to me about something as important as the value of my currency, then I'm probably not going to trust their fucking ICO coin. Especially not when I've got 1,000 options out there that are not that fucking coin that work better than that coin and retain value better than that coin. And this is why what's more likely, I think, the outcome of all of this is that we will shift back to a multi-currency base. That we're, we're not going to be restricted to fiat currencies issued by private banks. And that's really what they are. Central banks are private banks. They're, they're private entities and they need to make a profit too. There's nothing wrong with that. They're a business. They provide a, a, an excellent service. But there are alternatives to it. And so now they have to be better. And I'll tell you why. Even if, even if Bitcoin itself gets goofed around, there are hundreds of options available right now that will compete with it. And they will provide that incentive to be better. And we're starting to see that with Bitcoin. That 
certain individuals, and I, I've started to think about this in a more expansive way the, these days, that, you know, just because these people are currently doing what they're doing, um, it doesn't mean that other people are going to agree with them or follow suit. And I, I think that's that's one of my great assurances with cryptocurrencies is that there is still the option to dissent. There is still the option to shift your hashing power over to another coin, run another implementation of Bitcoin, whatever. You know, it's your hardware. You have the choice of how you want to run it. And I think there's been just a teeny tiny shift of confidence away from the uh, the main suppliers of new updates for Bitcoin's code base. And um, I, I take comfort in them because I think the miners should be using their option to support whatever implementation they want and whatever services they want to be actually supporting. You know, if they if they note that the B, the Bitcoin network is primarily being used by big banks to circumvent the uh, circumvent the controls that they would be experiencing on their uh, on their their own networks, they they might say, "You know what? I, I don't want to support that monetary activity. Fuck that. I'm going to shift over to this version of Bitcoin that doesn't do lightning." And, and you know, when I move my petahashes over the, the majority of the network will probably follow me and that'll be that'll be that anyway continuing on I got this article here on medium.com and uh, I I gotta read it, it it's it, it's too tantalizing for me uh, mostly because I've been against lightning network I, I don't think that scaling quote unquote off chain is the way to go you know, we've already eliminated the need for trusted third parties. Why the fuck do we want to introduce them into the payment processing end of things? I don't know. Anyway, this is by RQ732P. Um, Z. Let's do a... Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if this person has a penis or not. Anyway, continuing on. The Lightning Network is vulnerable to attack. God damn, that's a salacious title. In this article, I will explain why the Lightning Network is vulnerable to attack and thus will likely not become a useful technology. My main thesis is simple. The Lightning Network is vulnerable because with only a relatively small investment, a malicious actor can seriously degrade the network to the point that many users will find its failure, failure rate intolerable. Users will leave the network, which will further reduce its functionality, leading to a cascading cycle of fewer users and declining functionality. Without a fundamental redesign of the, the network cannot be defended against such, such malicious actors. Since my argument is a broad conceptual one, I won't dwell on fine details since most of them can only be estimated anyway. The Basic Design of Lightning The Lightning Network is a payment system. It consists of users and channels. The purpose of the system is to allow any user to transfer Bitcoin to any other user quickly, under a few seconds, and cheaply, less than a few tenths of one US cent. Any two users of the Lightning system may establish a channel. A channel requires one or both users to keep a balance of Bitcoin in what is essentially an escrow account. Establishing a channel takes around 20 minutes and requires one user to initially commit some amount of Bitcoin to the channel. Bitcoin can be transferred across channels. The amount that can be transferred in a given direction is the capacity in that direction between the users. For instance, imagine a channel between Alice and Bob that was established by Alice with one Bitcoin. The channel has a capacity of one Bitcoin in the direction of Alice to Bob. It therefore allows the transfer from Alice to Bob of any amount less than or equal to one Bitcoin. Transfers 
along such channels take place quickly because they are limited only by the communication delay between Alice and Bob's computers. Sending payments using intermediaries. The innovation of Lightning is to allow the transfer of payments between users who are not connected by a channel. Such transfers are accomplished by using intermediaries. For instance, Alice can transfer Bitcoin to Charles. She first transfers the payment to Bob, who then transfers it to Charles. However, the transfer described above is only possible if there are channels with sufficient capacity from, Bob, from Alice to Bob and from Bob to Charles. As currently implemented, a single transfer can traverse a path of up to 20 users. So, a transfer by a user who sends a payment to himself can cross up to 18 other channels. The nub of the problem with Lightning. Imagine that Alice wants to transfer one Bitcoin to Zach using a path of intermediaries. For example, Alice to Bob, Bob to Carol, Carol to Zach, to somebody else, all the way to Zach. To initiate the transfer, Alice makes a commitment to Bob requiring her to put aside one Bitcoin for the channel capacity. That one Bitcoin eventually is either number one claimed by Bob if the transfer succeeds or number two refunded to Alice if the transfer is rejected by the network or Zach does not receive it in a period of time called the timeout. As the transfer moves from user to user along the path, each user makes a similar commitment to the next user in the path, requiring, requiring him to put aside one Bitcoin from his channel capacity. If the timeout were on the order of seconds, there would be no problem. However, the timeout can range from an hour to days depending on the length of the path and the options set in the channel. When Alice initiates her transfer to Zach, there are three possibilities that can occur within a few seconds. Number one, Zach successfully receives the transfer. Number two, the network rejects the transfer because, for instance, there is insufficient capacity. Or number three, the network does not reject the transfer, but Zach does not receive the transfer. The last possibility is the nub of the problem. Alice's transfer is not guaranteed to either succeed or fail quickly. The transfer can go into an unresolved state which can last until, until the timeout expires. The unresolved state can last for hours to days. During that time, the channel capacities along each step of the path Alice to Bob, Bob to Carol, etc., are reduced by one Bitcoin until the, channel, until the channel timeout expires on that step of the path. The timeouts for the intermediary steps are less than for Alice. Also, Alice will not know whether the transfer will eventually succeed or time out. At that point, Alice has two undesirable choices. Number one, to resend the payment on Lightning or use another payment method and trust that Zach will refund one of the payments if the first payment succeeds. Or number two, do nothing and wait until the payment succeeds or times out. Channel capacity is the resource that the network offers. Successful transfers require capacity on the network, so reducing capacity reduces the ability to successfully complete transfers and increases the probability of transfer failures. Hypothetically then, a malicious actor who runs several copies of the Lightning software on different computers, that is, who has several different user identities on the network, can degrade the system in two ways. Number one, reduce channel capacity. The attacker can route a payment to herself across a maximum path of 20 users. She can then cause the transfer to not complete and to go into the unresolved state. At the all the intermediary chance trend, all the intermediary channels in the path will have the amount of the transfer stuck and unusable. 
She, so she is able to reduce aggregate capacity by about 20 Bitcoin for each Bitcoin in the transfer. Number two, causing system failure for other users by offering and announcing a channel with low fees. The attacker can put transfers across her channels into the unresolved state so the attacker can cause other users to see their transfers go into the unres unresolved state which is from the sender's viewpoint, a transfer failure. Reliability In order to be widely adopted, a payment system must be reliable. How reliable a system must be can only be estimated. For some users, if a payment fails once in 1,000 attempts, the user will abandon the system. For other users, a rate of one failure in 50 attempts might be tolerable. I will assume that a 5% failure rate most users will abandon the system. Assuming that a malicious actor can reduce aggregate capacity by 20 Bitcoin for every one Bitcoin that he is willing to lock up for a, for a period of time, note that the attacker will eventually recover all of his Bitcoin. He is only making his Bitcoin unavailable for the duration of the attack. His only costs are the Bitcoin transaction fees for establishing channels and the very small fees that Lightning users can charge for forwarding transfers. The cost of the attack is small, but the, the impact can be, may be very large. If the attacker just con controls just 5% of the capacity, he can likely reduce network capacity enough to cause an unacceptably high rate of transfer failures or assume that the attacker establishes enough user identities and channel capacity so that only 5% of transfers crosses channels. Then he can put all of those transfers into the unresolved state and cause an unacceptably high rate of transfer failures. So such an attacker can disrupt the network in two ways and can likely cause total costs to other users of the network far beyond the costs to himself. As users who will not tolerate given a, a given failure rate leave the network, their, cha their channel capacity will also leave the network, thereby causing a higher failure rate, causing more users and capacity to leave the network, and so on. The cost to the attacker is almost trivial. The Bitcoin transaction fees to establish channels, plus the very low fees on the Lightning Network, plus the time cost of the Bitcoin in his channels. If he is passively holding Bitcoin in a wallet anyway, then the time cost is zero, yet the impact on the network is potentially massive. In summary, it will be far too easy for an attacker or a group of attackers to cause the whole Lightning Network to experience at least a 5% pay payment rate failure. Users will then leave the network, leading to a catastrophic cycle of increasing failure rates and fewer users. Additional details I have purposely left out most of the technical details of the Lightning Network and how the described attacks would be carried out. My aim is to illustrate the basic idea. The design features of Lightning that make the attack possible are these. Number one. The sender plans the path for the transfer before sending the transfer so it is easy for the attacker to create a long path a long path affecting many other users. Number 2. If a user controls several uh, several user identities, she can probe the network by transferring payments between ident between her identities and possibly identifying especially vulnerable channels. Number 3. The network is designed to accommodate users going offline unexpectedly or experiencing communication delays, and so is not designed to require that transfers either complete or fail in seconds. 4. Because the network requires that users monitor and interact with the Bitcoin blockchain, it must accommodate fairly long periods of time on the order of blockchain block time of 10 minutes. With all of the buffer times, delays, and grace periods built into the network, over a long path, the time that, that a transfer can be unresolved can easily stretch to days. 
5. The privacy goals of the network which keep intermediaries unaware of the other users on the path, except the previous and next steps, make it difficult or impossible to identify malicious actors on the network. So, any attempt to blacklist malicious users would ca cause many non-malicious actors to be blacklisted also. Mitigation the simplest mitigation strategy would be to enforce some minimum fee for acting as an intermediary in a transfer, thereby making the attacker's strategy too expensive, but that would defeat the purpose of lightning. There has been some discussion of tracking payment failures and avoiding users involved in, t in, fa in failed payments, but those ideas are problematic because, number one, they increase the complexity of the network. Number two, if a user were to keep track of all, no all nodes across her which her transfers were always successful and transfer only across those quote, well-behaved nodes, she would be limiting the effective capacity of the network for her transfers. Number three, if there are a way to identify malicious actor actors, the attacker could easily switch identities public keys, and IP addresses. 4. If a reputation type system were designed to spread information using the so-called gossip protocol among users about well-behaved and badly behaved users on the network, that would open a new avenue for malicious attackers to spoof the reputation system and may make the problem even worse. Conclusion if your credit card went, went into an unresolved state even occasionally, causing you significant frustration each time, you would probably start carrying cash instead. The Lightning Network is fragile. Fragile things don't last. Yeah, I think this is a, um, this is an interesting perspective, although I think that, uh, the danger is a little bit more pronounced than the um, than the author here supposes. There is another solution to all of it, <clears throat> and that's that you have a um, a licensed entity, you know, a regulated licensed entity that is the issuer and receiver of all of the uh, all the payment channel transactions. So when you're initiating a payment channel, you're not initiating it on the, on the Bitcoin network. You're sending money to this third-party intermediary who will be putting your, your transactions in with theirs. And the way that they, they will discern between their, their transactions and everybody else's transactions will be that they have some sort of taint that they associate with their transactions. So that if an unlicensed or unregulated node is, try, is trying to broadcast to them transactions or, or route through them transactions, if they lack this taint, the transaction will not be included in, in a uh, payment channel. Or the, the payment channel won't be established. <clears throat> and, and this is a... Um, this is kind of a danger that I think that a lot of people are not really considering. You know, there's I, I've talked about this multiple times on this show that I believe that states and federal entities already have regulatory frameworks in place right now, already have gotten ahead of everybody with regard to the terminology that they're going to be using in this legislation. And they're free to modify it at their their choice later on. Um, they've already included money transmitter and um, what's the other one? Custodian. In in FinCEN's own own words, they they coined basically new legal definitions for these to be included within the cryptos cryptospheres protocols and uh, ways of doing things. And while, when I read the the material first, I think it was in 2014, and I, I did a live read of it. And as a matter of fact, you can uh, you can find that on my YouTube channel. I, I went back and read it again. I, I've read it multiple times. Anyway, I didn't understand at the time what they were talking about when they were talking about money transmitters. 
or custodians because as I understood the Bitcoin network, there were no custodians. I mean, you know, there's there's you and there's the nodes and then there's the miners. You you broadcast your fucking transaction out on out to the nodes, the nodes flick it over to the miners, the miners include it in a block and and you get your first confirmation as soon as it's confirmed in a block. Right? So I, I didn't really understand. I didn't I didn't get what where they were talking about fitting all this in, right? And so then the first descriptions and first rumors of Lightning Network came out and off-chain transacting comes out. And I'm like, oh, shit. This is it. This is what they were talking about. You, you see what I'm talking about? Or you see what I'm saying? If you go back and you, you go to my YouTube channel... Um, I think there's one in there called Hand in Glove or something to that effect. Um, listen to that one. I, I went into it way deeper. Um, but with regard to this, I, I think that's probably the biggest danger with this, that these kind of security threats that the, this uh, person is is pointing out in this paper very very aptly, I, I should say. That, um, it, solid, solid information here as far as threat potentials to the lightning network but consider this with this existing as a potential threat as as you know um bad actors or malicious actors being nodes on the on um, payment channels um is that exists as a threat to this this network that they're talking about or or they're working on establishing and using for commercial transfers and all that other shit. Um, I, I don't think people will be willing to endure that kind of risk. I mean, every, every single Bitcoin transaction I have ever tried to do eventually got its confirmations. Every Bitcoin trend, Bitcoin Cash transaction that I've ever done, every Ripple transaction, every Ethereum transaction, every Verge transaction, every Dogecoin transaction, Litecoin transaction, every one of them went through, got confirmed, got included on a blockchain. Why would I sacrifice that trustless transaction that well, so far in my book has a that, that transaction medium has a 100% success rate as far as I'm concerned um, why am I going to switch from that to a system where I need to trust intermediaries in between and there is an actual opportunity for it to fail that has not existed previously on any of the on-chain transactions that I've done. Why would I do that? I wouldn't. Whether or not you do, that is up to you. But personally, I do not believe in it. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. And what to play, though. It's always kind of a... I should have said a conundrum. Because I got a lot of good stuff. There we go. That's Fear Factory. Hmm. That gives me an idea. Let's get down to it. Where is it here? Obsolete. Here we go. Fear Factory. Obsolete. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Rivers of Nile with a home. I just got a message. Where is it? Stop. <laughs> Fuck you. Yeah. I keep getting somebody in uh, Telegram telling me to stop spamming. Can't do it, man. Fuck. Oh. <laughs> I, I had to go extra special on that one. <clears throat> Man. So, enough with fudding. I just saw this, uh, this article here on the, um, on the old Twitter feed. And, uh, <clears throat> my apologies, sir. 
Um, I think this one deserves some air. This is on uh, Bitcoin.com. Fidelity invest in launching crypto custody and trading services. Hmm. Some of the mainstream adoption we're always talking about, right? And uh, this by Kevin Helms, authored approximately one hour ago, according to this. Um, so yes, penis. Fidelity Investments has announced the launch of a new company dedicated to providing cryptocurrency services, including custody and trade execution. The services will be available to institutional investors such as hedge, hedge funds, family offices, and market intermediaries. But what about me, dude? <clears throat> Leading finan uh, New crypto company formed. Leading financial services company, uh, a corporation Fidelity Investments, announced on Monday the launch of a new company called Fidelity Digital Asset Services, LLC. The firm explained, quote, The company will offer enterprise quality custody and trade execution services for digital assets, commodity commonly referred to as cryptocurrencies. To sophisticated institutional investors such as hedge funds, family offices, and market intermediaries. <clears throat> um, if they're sophisticated institutional investors, why do they need somebody else to facilitate their transfers? I don't get it. The services offered will be in three areas. Institutional grade custody, trade execution, and and dedicated client service. The custody service will provide, quote, a secure, compliant, and institutional grade omnibus storage solution for Bitcoin, Ether, and other digital assets. Fidelity detailed, adding that its solution consists of vaulted cold storage and an access control system the firm described as, quote, multi level physical and cyber. The trade execution service will leverage the firm's in internal crossing engine and smart order router, which will quote will allow for execution at multiple market venues. Lastly, its clients ha quote will have access to a dedicated team of client service specialists from onboarding throughout the entire relationship with the company. The firm elaborated. Tom Jessup, head of Fidelity Digital Asset Services, told CNBC that the firm already works with 13,000 institutional clients. He noted, quote, These institutions require a sophisticated level of service and security equal to the experience they're used to when trading stocks or bonds. With... Um, with assets under administration of $7.2 trillion, Fidelity says it, it helps more than 27 million people invest their own life savings and employs more than 40,000 associates. Fidelity, Fidelity's Crypto Efforts <coughs> Fidelity, Fidelity Investments Chairman and CEO Abigail J. P. Johnson Hmm, I wonder if she looks familiar. Kind of. Abigail P. Johnson first revealed her firm's crypto plans in May last year. She said at the time, quote, I love this stuff and what the future holds. I'd like to think that huge new markets and products will be built on top of those open platforms. The firm began researching cryptocurrency in its blockchain incubator in 2013. It has experimented with crypto mining and has integrated with Coinbase to allow customers to see their crypto balances on the Fidelity website. In 2017, Fidelity Charitable, a public charity, received $69 million in crypto donations. In Monday's announcement, Johnson commented, quote, Our goal is to make digitally native assets such as Bitcoin more accessible to investors. 
We expect to continue investing and experimenting over the long term with ways to make this emerging asset class easier for our clients to understand and use. That's what I'm here, dude. That, that, that's why I'm here, to help them understand and use them without necessarily your participation. What do you think of Fidelity launching crypto custody and trading services? Let us know in the comment section below and there are no comments. Terribly surprising. Not really. Um yeah, so Fidelity the only the only thing this really says to me is it's a, it's a vote of confidence in cryptocurrencies and obviously due to their duration of involvement it could easily be said that they, they've probably been a whale in a movement or two by now. You know, that massive sell-offs and massive buy-ins could just as likely have been by Fidelity Investments over the last, what, five years? I mean, they've been, they've been dicking around with it since 2013, so that, that should give you an idea that they have... They have some sort of depth of experience with regard to cryptocurrencies, and so to simply uh, simply blow this off would be, I believe, a mistake. I think that uh, the duration of their their participation in the crypto sphere is probably going to lend some credibility to them. However, I don't know that the um, the long term drive for most people is going to be relying on on institutions such as fidelity i mean when i when i can have a wallet on my uh, on my phone that does everything that fidelity can do and is limited only by the the volumes of money that i and my trading partners have <clears throat> i i i really have a a, a difficult time seeing how they would be able to remain viable over the longer term. Now, I, I'm sure that there will always be, or at least initially, there will be people that need institutions such as Fidelity Investments to be uh, helping them curate their funds. However, I am absolutely certain there are children out there right now. Children involved in this space, and, and no one is the wiser about it. You know, and that that's one of the the humorous things I find about the the uh, perspective of regulation. You know, when these uh, these legislators are talking about regulating cryptocurrencies, they have no idea that they're talking about regulating their their 16 year old nieces and nephews who are trading in their their time that they're not in uh, not in school, and those that aren't trading, they're developing some of this shit. They're writing the code for some of these projects. This is a reality. This is not... I mean, you're only limited by your cons your ability to participate. I mean, your, your desire to participate. You know, I mean, if you're... If you're, say, uh, an economics monk... I, I remember... Uh, I remember this stupid show back in... <clears throat> back in the 80s called Family Ties... And uh, one of the features of the show was um, Michael J. Fox's character. And basically, he was like an aspiring Gordon Gecko. You know, he, he's like all... It, it, during the, the um, morning interlude, you know, during breakfast, when they're, they're sitting around the, the uh, breakfast table, he, he's reading the business section. You know, he's checking stocks and shit like that. Well... I happen to believe that there are kids out there right now that are just like that, but about cryptocurrencies, you know, and that their their parents help them along just a little bit, you know, try try and encourage them to uh, to be into something at least, right? Maybe maybe give them the credit card number so they can set up a Coinbase account, um, but that those kids are participating now. I, I think that's the one the one barrier that these um, regulators who would be regulators that is um, I, I think that's the one big stumbling block they run into you know that between their own involvement 
and the likelihood that their own involvement would be kind of uh, made public. Um, that that threat alone is significant enough to kind of stay their hand with regard to regulation. But I also believe that their children, their their relatives, their friends are involved in cryptocurrencies too. And because of that, <clears throat> they're looking at that reality and the, the they've probably even experienced some sort of monetary gain that they're not reporting to anybody um, due to this involvement. And so the threat of that being exposed is uh, it's it's a bit like being doxxed for sexual harassment or something like that, where you know it could really cost you a lot on the public stage. So what you want to consider, basically, quote unquote, criminal activity, you really have to watch. You know, it's like, do I really want to craft a noose to, that's around my own neck? as well as the neck of the people that I'm intending to regulate. You know, and we're, we're a lot more interconnected than, than some people would like to think in that way. Anyway, I got some more articles here. We got that one. We're done with that one. Oh, this is a big one. This, this one I really, really, really wanted to cover. Man, they took it out of me in jiu-jitsu today. Sorry about that. Anyway, this one's on uh, CCN.com. And uh, let's see if they give us an author. <clears throat> no, none. But I, I do want to. As Tether loses USD peg, OKX will list, quote, regulated cryptocurrency stable coins. Um, <laughs> stable coins are a stupid idea, but we'll continue. If Tether, USDT, is truly backed by and redeemable for physical U.S. dollars stored in company-controlled bank accounts, the so-called cryptocurrency, quote, stable coin should manage to weather this period of uncharacteristic volatility until arbitrage restores its USD peg. If not... We could be witnessing the unraveling of the token that sees more daily trading volume than any other cryptocurrency except for Bitcoin. The latest chapter in the $2.4 billion Tether's trial by fire will see OKX, the world's second largest cryptocurrency exchange, list four USDT competitors including offerings from industry heavyweights Gemini and Circle, uh, i.e. Goldman Sachs. Beginning today, OKX traders will begin depositing Gemini Dollar, GUSD, Paxos Standard, PAX, USD Coin, US, USDC, and True USD, TUSD, into their exchange accounts. Tomorrow morning at 2, 2 p.m. HKT, or Hong Kong time, on October 16th, each U.S. dollar-pegged cryptocurrency will begin trading against both Bitcoin and Tether. Three hours later, the tokens will be available for withdrawal. Tether, as CCN reported, lost its USD peg on Monday, despite recovering somewhat from its interday low, has, of the time of writing, failed to return to dollar parity despite copious opportunities for traders to profit from USDT arbitrage. On U.S. cryptocurrency exchange Kraken, USDT traded as low as 85 cents against physical U.S. dollars and continued to trade at a 7 cent discount to its support va supposed value as of the time of writing. With more opportunities for investors to trade Tether directly against its upstart competitors, the market will finally have a chance to so sort out whether Tether the, along the, quote, dominant stablecoin as measured by both market cap and trading volume is as trustworthy an asset as its issuer and supporters claim. 
Even if critters, uh, critics are incorrect in alleging Tether's operations are not all above board, a, sub- a sustained departure from dollar parity accompanied by a loss of market share could incentivize the company, along with the cryptocurrency exchange Bitfinex, with whom it reportedly shares a management team, to operate with less opacity and perhaps even undergo this, the long-called-for full audit of its balance sheet. Answering to subpoenas would be nice, too. Already, PAX and TUSD have achieved daily volumes of $11 million and $27 million against Tether on Binance, with each trading at a premium of at least 8% to USDT. <clears throat> GUSD and USDC are trading at similar premiums to USDT, though these markets have not seen as much volume. Meanwhile, cryptocurrency payment processor BitPay has just announced that it will support settlements in two stablecoins, GUSD and USDC. Tether, despite its dominant market share, was excluded from the new feature. Ah! There's one comment on here. Let's go ahead and get into it here. Um, Anne McCauley, um, what is it? Uh, SpinBitcoin.org will definitely bring out. Oh, never mind. Not going to even bother. So, yeah, we've been worried about this for quite a while now. That uh, Tether's. <sighs> oh, wait. Here, let's get into this other one, too. We'll, we'll get into this one in just a moment, but <clears throat> yeah, tether losing its dollar pairing—that's that's deep because they like it was as was commented in that previous article. Um, it is the second largest traded cryptocurrency by volume, so yeah, <laughs> does not bode well for them, not at all. And I um. I'm not all that sympathetic to them. They they were trying to take on a venture that I think all of these quote unquote stable coins will eventually fail. I commented to uh, Ron Paul on Twitter about this too that I I've often been confused with the uh, with the placidity that institutions have uh, have embraced tether with you know that it's like this is providing us with a nice little pairing to uh, to you know offset our losses you know so we're not experiencing significant losses when Bitcoin tanks gives us a little hedge right well <clears throat> they've had this position of trust and you know it's just it's been reported a lot about things like uh, mystery volumes of tether just coming onto the market and so on. It's it's not as um, it's not all that easy to get and keep our trust, and any kind of indications that you're abusing it is is going to be reprised. I'm sorry, man. It's that's just how this market is. Anyway. Uh, Got this article here on CCN, and it kind of backs up what we were talking about there. Bitcoin price explodes to $7,500 as Tether loses U.S. dollar peg. The Bitcoin slash USD pair closed yesterday on a modest 2% gain in a pennant formation action following the recent drop. Nevertheless, the couple started picking momentum, uh, picking up momentum during the early Asian trading session and jumped to as high as $7,800 fiat from its previous low to nearly 6300 fiat. At the same time, Tether's USDT slash USD pair lost, uh, pair lost King crashing down below the uh, point or 95 cent fiat at the beginning of the Asian session. It eventually formed lower lows towards 85 cents before correcting higher towards the towards 90 cents. 
The pair, however, continues to be far from its $1 peg that is creating a negative sentiment about its future in the crypto space. Bank Insolvency FUD Tether is closely tied to Bitfinex, a global crypto exchange which lately has dropped Noble Bank as its banking partner. The amount of U.S. dollars required to back Tether's USDT token supply were reportedly deposited in the same bank, which caused the stablecoin temporary hassles. Later, reports started to surface that Tether had no money to back its total supply, with many of them calling the stablecoin project a scam. They also found a strong connection between the chiefs of Bitfinex, Tether, and Noble Bank, especially at the time when Noble Bank became a strong point of concern for the Puerto Rican regulators. Reportedly, the authorities issued a warning to the firm, the details of which couldn't be ma- couldn't make the press. Couldn't make it to press. Uh, to the press. The needle then points to one thing. Whether Tether has funds to support its USDT supply or not, it can only be found out with a clear and transparent audit. But, even on that front, the project has not come has not come reasonably well. Against the promises made in their original white paper, the, U- the Tether team has not conducted a, prime, uh, a proper financial audit. It had, however, hired a legal firm, which already had a business relationship with Tether and Noble Bank, to perform an inspection. All stories collectively have created a negative community sentiment for USDT. Retail investors are already exchanging their Tether holdings for Bitcoin and other top coins, which have also seen an impressive rally in the past 24 hours. Quote, There is no guarantee that you can redeem your tethers. There should be a way for Tether to to repurchase them from you for $1. There is not. For me, this whole thing smells like when Mt. Gox went belly up. You want to hold your bags? Well, that is your decision. It is not why I'm in crypto, one of the crypto users commented on Reddit. Tether's social media handles posted nothing during the crash. Yeah, they're probably not going to either. Let's uh, let's try out some of the comments here. We got a few of them actually. Uh, the first one is by Positive Trading. Quote: The Bitcoin USD pair closed yesterday on a modest two percent gain in pennant formation action following the recent drop. Nevertheless, the couple started picking momentum during the Asian trading session and jumped as high as $7,800 fiat from its pre- Wrong, Yashu. You don't know the difference between USD and USDT? The price of Bitcoin with USDT went to $7,800. The price in US dollars went to $6,800. Even in even the stock, stock market futures showed 6800 tops. People, the CCN site is so far only good for alerts. Readers, the writer's information, they are not really professional. Perhaps they are informed, but they do not usually write credibly and mislead with wrong information. Readers should be wary and read carefully. Lots of mistakes in their articles. Uh, Guy Fox says, This tether fiasco is exactly why crypto is not achieving adoption and is greeted with skepticism by regulatory authorities. Too, mar- too many charlatans and frauds involved. I'll be luck- lucky to get any of my money unlocked. $4,000. She'll be coming around Mt. Gox again when she comes. Yeah, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about Tether and the, uh, the reality that you cannot cannot pair a cryptocurrency with a fiat currency. You just can't do it. And Gemini is going to find this out. And Goldman Sachs is going to find this out. And everybody else that's trying to do a quote-unquote stable coin is going to find this out. 
It only works for a short per period of time, and it's only profitable for a slight, slightly longer period than that. But that's it. After that point, you hit the point of diminishing returns, diminishing interest. People start, you know, looking at your books a little bit questionably, especially if you're flushing the market with billions of dollars worth of new units at a time. You know, we start we start getting a little suspicious, and you're going to need to do it. You know, Tether didn't didn't just develop that problem overnight. You know, they didn't have two billion or two point six billion dollars worth of trust all accumulated at once. They they built up to that. So yeah, I I can't say it enough. And and Tyler and, and your brother I mean, or um I, I can't remember your brother's name, sorry man. Uh you guys ought to really abandon the uh the Gemini token while you can. Because while it looks good on its face, you will be throwing your own money into it, and um, it's going to be costing you. It's going to cost you. you know. But uh, yeah, this this material made it all the way over to uh, Zero Hedge, and they're usually um, they. I don't know how much they report on uh, cryptocurrencies. Most of the stuff that I pick up on Zero Hedge is mostly about like oil and gold and shit like that. But um, but yeah, I've got this uh, this article and it is by Tyler Durden apparently. Uh, and this was authored 10-15-2018. Tether tumbles below critical $1 threshold as dollar-pegged crypto doubts soar. An update... Careful to quickly assuage any potential loss of the narrative and, quote, full faith and credit of the stablecoin. Tether released a statement on the USDT drop, quote, We would like to reiterate that although markets have shown temporary fluctuations in price, all USDT in circulation are sufficiently backed by U.S. dollars and that assets have always exceeded liabilities. See? Nothing to panic about. The only cryptocurrency not rallying right now is the one pegged to the U.S. dollar. The week started off green for cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ripple, and Ethereum. Collectively, the three of them rose by about 7% according to a CNBC article out early Monday morning. Bitcoin came close to topping $7,000 again, but digital currencies remain in the midst of a longer-term downtrend that has continued over the last year. This downtrend among all cryptos was exacerbated by the sharp moves lower in equity markets last week, which prompted billions of dollars of digital currency market cap to be wiped away. But Monday kicked off a new week, and cryptos are all trying to bounce or pair their losses from last week, for now at least. Interestingly enough, the only crypto not participating in the early week rally was Tether, a digital currency that is pegged to the U.S. dollar. Tether was trading 2.5% lower, down to down to 96 cents after falling much lower earlier in the morning. This chart of the carnage, as it happened on the Kraken Exchange, was posted at about 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Monday morning by Twitter user Bitfinext and shows Tether printing as low as 85 cents. <clears throat> the, firm, the firm that runs the digital currency Tether LTD has recently been questioned about whether or not it holds enough, quote, reserves to match the amount of tokens in circulation. The company claims that it does. Chris Hader, the chief executive of comparison, of comparison site Crypto Compare, told CNBC, quote, There is concern about Tether and whether it is truly backed by dollars and rumors about USDT being delisted from various exchanges. These delisting rumors probably aren't helping quell volatility either. This comes after one industry publication claims that Bitfinex, a cryptocurrency exchange connected to Tether, has suspended deposits in U.S. dollars, euros, sterling, and yen. 
Matty Greenspan, senior market analyst at eToro, told CNBC, quote, If the perception that Tether can hold a stable value is called into question, traders who are holding USDT are most likely to shift their funds into other cryptos in order to hold their value. Damn Skippy. The point of Tether isn't necessarily to appreciate in value, but but rather it is known as a quote, stable coin, because it is supposed to, in theory, always trade around one dollar. The digital currency is seen as a way for those worried about the volatility of fiat to crypto exchange rates to ensure that they can reliably convert US dollars into digital currencies. From there, Tether can be used to purchase other digital currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. The question of whether or not Tether's parent company holds enough reserves is hardly the first controversy for the coin. We released a report days ago highlighting finance professor John Griffin, who along with his doctoral student companion Amin Shams, was one of, or Shams, was one of, one of the two academics that drew market-moving conclusions about Bitcoin last year, while the digital currency was trading around twenty thousand dollars. After sifting sifting through two terabytes of trading data, they alleged that Bitcoin was being manipulated by someone using Tether to purchase it. To us, Tether seems like a counterintuitive idea in the face in the sense that it is backed by fiat, which is the main problem that Bitcoin initially seek to solve. Forgive, forgive us if we are not surprised the only digital currency that tries to be more like the dollar instead of less, instead of less like it, winds up being one of the first to collapse. And, and uh, to um, <clears throat> to comment further on that, and uh, it's not the first to actually have this problem. <laughs> I mean, uh, we we saw the same thing happen to Paycoin, and, and I do not believe. It will end any better for for uh, tether. <laughs> so, anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music, just a taste before we close out. And uh, we haven't played any sixth, and 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 I feel it. I feel the need. So here it is: sixth scent of the obscene here on Coin Metal. And that was Slayer with Perversions of Pain. And it is with that that we are going to close this episode out. We will be back again on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, I'd like you all to trade safe. Do your homework. And watch out for your own bunghole because no stable coin in the world will keep it for you. And uh, yeah... Thank you again for listening. I certainly do appreciate the support. Uh, we will be back, like I said, on Wednesday. But as far as our last dance, we haven't picked one out yet, of course. Because, well, you know, you just can't do that. Here it is. Push It by Static X. The last dance here on Coin Metal. Thank you again for listening. And you all have a good night.